BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. Welcome to the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned Dahan, and let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Tuesday, and on Tuesdays in the past, I used to do a segment called True Crime Talk Radio, where I would talk about multiple subjects within one episode. Sometimes there would be an interlocking nature to them, but other times it would just be about examining different aspects of the true crime world. And today I'm going to begin with some things about the Zodiac Killer, and then I will be discussing the Bayou Strangler, a serial killer case from Louisiana. And to those of you who are new to the channel, every Monday I do a segment about the Zodiac Killer, called the Zodiac Killer News Report, but it's more commonly known as just Zodiac Monday. And there was some leftover material that I really wanted to respond to. I didn't want to wait until next week. So I will be exploring that in this episode here. And tomorrow there will be an episode of Ripper Wednesday, getting back into the swing with Jack the Ripper and exploring perhaps the world's most famous unsolved murder mystery. And if you would like to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, I invite you to hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And a great way to support all of these efforts is to go through some of the links in the description box. And one of them is for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. And I'm hoping that in the future there will be guests on the program, not only for Zodiac Monday, but for all of the subjects, whether it's talking about Jack the Ripper or on the Friday show where any subject is fair game. And I'll be interacting with true crime writers and theorists and people who have some first-hand experiences with these stories. And then you guys can respond in the comments section down below. And I really want to make a point about that. This show would not exist without you guys in the audience. I mean, I know that sounds like an obvious statement, but especially, especially the people who leave comments and contribute to the discussions, which later on get worked into future episodes of Black Box Online Radio, I thank you so much, and I encourage you to just share what you genuinely think about these true crime stories. And I said that I wanted to begin with some things about the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac was a serial killer who operated in California in 1968 and 69, and whatever happened before or after that is anybody's guess. And I was doing the regular Monday show, and I received an email from someone named Moonlight. Light is spelled L-I-T-E. And that Moonlight had some comments about Black Box Online Radio and Zodiac Monday. Once again, if you're new to the channel, I've been doing Black Box Online Radio for six years. I didn't always do the Zodiac Monday show. It used to be just putting out an episode here and there, and then it turned into doing one a day, seven days a week. I would just do a short episode, usually up to 20 minutes long. And then in the fall of 2020, I decided to create Zodiac Monday, where I would devote Monday exclusively to the Zodiac Killer. In the past, there wasn't any type of allotted Zodiac time. I just talked about the Zodiac here and there, and then a little bit more frequently, and ultimately it turned into the Zodiac Killer News Report, where, much like True Crime Talk Radio, I could discuss multiple subjects at once. But Moonlight sent in a comment, a very lengthy comment, to the email address, blackboxonlineradio at aol.com, and it says, Blocking and censoring viewers is not a way to build your channel. The alignment and protection provided for TV has kept you all with a low audience. The reason your mentor has been successful is the message board. Firstly, I want to be clear, I do not have a mentor, I do not have an advisor, I do not have any type of script writer or anybody providing background notes or anything. I mean, I ask people questions all the time. This is an interactive show, it's an intermediary show. Sometimes I share my own observations about the Zodiac Killer, why not? But I definitely write to people, I definitely ask particular challenge questions of other Zodiac writers and true crime writers. But I do not have any specific mentor of any kind. I'm not even sure where that's coming from. Debunking people's suspects turns a large audience away. Ridiculing those you interview also does not allow the viewer audience their own thoughts on what is presented, turning them away from interest. Wouldn't you rather be the person they all turn to watch or be the person that badmouths them and they avoid? You have great content and are well-versed and have captivating information and factual information, but it is ruined with debating the audience by your ridicule. 
And this is um, something that really surprised me, but it does continue here. When I realized that I was censored this week from commenting on your channel, you could have just deleted the comment, but you went beyond that. I lost interest in further viewing. The case will never be resolved, but denying someone's past or destroying their image of what occurred will not help matters. And this continues in a second email. It's like a two-part set of emails that is from Moonlight. When I posted a few comments back, I signed out of YouTube and went back to view some of my comments while not signed in, and they were not there. Waited until the next day and still not there. Whether you or YouTube censored me doesn't matter. I have lost interest as a viewer. Well, Moonlight, I am sorry that you had that experience and sorry to see you go, but that was absolutely not me. All last week, I was preparing to leave the United States and move to the Philippines. I did not delete a comment. I did not delete a single YouTube comment of any kind. That was definitely the YouTube bots. And a lot of people have been asking about censorship here on this channel and how their comments end up disappearing. That is 95% the YouTube bots, 5% me. Usually the only comments that I end up deleting are the ones that contain some type of discriminatory comment wording, some type of discrimination, some type of abusive language, like when people start insulting someone's family members. Yes, I do delete things like that. But as far as anything that was shared about the Zodiac Killer mystery, no, uh, that wasn't me. And again, I mean, the YouTube censorship is out of control. I complain about them all the time. So, I mean, there really is very little that any of us can do about that. And that's why people are looking toward other platforms to explore any type of content, Rumble and Twitch and even other things like Facebook and Instagram. And I, I think the, the censorship on Facebook is going to be pretty rough as well, though. But as far as the debunking episodes go, I did do an, a series in 2021 called the Debunking Series where I would challenge other people's suspects. All of that is 100% correct. And I was very reluctant to call it the debunking series because of an individual named James Randi. And he once stated that he would explore not true crime, but psychic phenomena. And he called himself an investigator. He even had a show for a while called Paranormal Investigator because he wanted to be very clear. He would challenge people, but he didn't want it to be presented as debunking. He wanted it to be presented as investigations. And I did an episode back in 2020 called just that. It was about Steve Hodel's theory that the Zodiac Killer was the Black Dahlia Avenger, the person who murdered Elizabeth Short back in the 1940s. And Steve Hodel has this theory that his father, George Hill Hodel, was not only the Black Dahlia Avenger, the murderer of Elizabeth Short, but he went on to become the Zodiac Killer, as well as committing, oh, I'm going to do some fast math here, as well as committing at least 19 additional murders, at least, though. And Steve Odell is still working through his theoretical observations. But yeah, I called it Investigation just for that particular reason. I didn't want it to be the debunking series where I'm solely focused on trying to prove somebody wrong. But I ultimately gave in and decided to create the debunking series in 2021. And it might not have been the best choice on my part. I'll even give you that, Moonlight. But I ultimately decided it was just a name. It's just a label. Of course, I'm not 100% able to rule out somebody's suspect. I am instead able to provide evidence to the contrary, where I don't think this person was the Zodiac killer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, because at the end of the day, it's true crime. It's not some type of fictional storytelling contest. It's not just who has the best imagination. It's not just who is the smartest and is able to weave together this amazingly worded theory. It's about what actually happened. And I might as well express what I think about these suspects and why they might not be the Zodiac Killer. Now that is quite different than the second part of Moonlight's comment about discrediting people's personal experiences. This is one that I will take exception with. I mean, I've mostly agreed with certain aspects of the thing about the debunking series. Okay, sure. But discrediting other people's personal experience, 
I will most likely only do that if I think the person is being fraudulent, if I think that the person is lying in some way, shape, or how, or if I think that they are just simply 100% mistaken about what happened. But I listen to people's experiences all the time. I was just talking to Sandy Betts about her own personal experiences with either interacting with the Zodiac Killer or her Zodiac Killer suspect. Sandy Betts is one of the co-authors of a new book called The Zodiac Killer 2023 Guide, and it it covers decades of her not only her own research but also her personal experiences and not once have I ever called her a liar and even somebody else who comes at it from a completely different platform. There's an individual named Ray Penrod who loves to just post comments all over Black Box Online Radio, even the old episodes, talking about his Zodiac Killer suspect Richard Ralph Mangan and how he knew him in San Quentin prison and I have never once called Ray Penrod a liar or tried to discredit him and his own personal experiences about what he has encountered. So I think that I will completely challenge uh, Moonlight on that one. But, I mean, as far as the comments that were sent in, some of it I am forced to admit I agree with, and other parts I am forced to disagree with. But the Zodiac Killer mystery is very complicated because there are so many different types of crimes. There are so many different aspects to the Zodiac Killer case because the first Zodiac crime took place on December 20th of 1968 with the Lake Herman Road murders where two teenagers are shot in more or less a... Um, it's the curved parking lot to a water pumping station road. I mean, I'm trying to get the exact word. It's almost just an extended part of the shoulder, a little gravel area on the side of the road. But then there's the Blue Rock Spring shooting, which is in a park. Then there's the Lake Berryessa stabbing, where the Zodiac Killer is not shooting the victims with a gun, but carried a gun, a knife, pre-cut lengths of rope, and possibly brought multiple markers I always remember this from uh, Mark Hewitt's book Exposed about how the Zodiac may have brought multiple colored markers, fel <coughs> excuse me, felt tip pens to the Lake Berryessa stabbing because he would go on to write a message on the victim's car door, but how would he have known that the car was a light color like white or any type of lighter color? What if the victim had a black car? Then he would have perhaps brought a white felt tip pen as well, or some type of lighter color, maybe even yellow or something like that. And I think that that's a reasonable observation, but there are so many possibilities in an unsolved case. Who are we to say that that's what happened? It could have been that Brian Hartnell or Cecilia Shepard were specifically targeted by the Zodiac, and they knew that Brian Hartnell would have been driving the light-colored car and somebody had been stalking them for an extended period of time. So the Lake Berryessa stabbing is very, very different. And then there's the Stein murder on October 11th of 1969, where Paul Stein, a lone male, is murdered inside a taxi cab. But I received an email from Michael Fisher, who has provided a lot of good uh, questions and comments for the show for Black Box Online Radio. And Michael Fisher has some things to say about the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa stabbing and the hooded costume that the perpetrator wore. Hi, Ned. Hope you're well. A chance to relax? Series 1, Prime Suspect on BBC, an oldie but a goodie. Ah, uh, yes, I was discussing Prime Suspect on an Anything Goes Friday episode. It was actually Prime Suspect 4 that I was discussing, but I have seen Prime Suspect 1 in the past with uh, DCI Jane Tennyson. That's the exploring um, the story of George Marlowe and his possible guilt in a murder, and uh, that's perhaps one of the more famous Prime Suspect series. But I was actually um, talking about Prime Suspect 4 recently, which involves the death of Dennis Carradine. He's a fictional character, but the reason why I incorporated it into BBO War was because of a very, um, a very similar set of circumstances compared to the death of David Carradine in real life. David Carradine, the actor from Kung Fu, Kill Bill, and uh, countless other films. And it really was just quite shocking. If you do listen to that episode, it's called The Death of David Carradine, A Dark Conspiracy. And one thing that I would love to do once Black Box Online Radio shifts more into a different format is I would love to do a full book discussion on the, on the book David Carradine, The Eye of My Tornado by Marina Anderson, because as I understand that book, we'll get into a little bit of the possibility of David Carradine being murdered, or the very least manslaughter taking place. And I am not the strongest conspiracy theorist in the world, but I think there's a very big case to show that either David Carradine was murdered, or that there was some type of foul play involved. Back to Michael Fisher's email. I listened to an older episode about the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and it seems that the ideas about the Zodiac Killer's costume 
start here and go forward, rather than the Mikado being an afterthought and used to go backwards and validate the costume. The Mikado is an operetta by Gilbert and Sullivan that features a character called Coco, the Lord High Executioner. I view any and all 1970s Zodiac with extreme suspicion and can believe that he never saw My Fair Lady or the Mikado or even had it in his mind at the time of Lake Berryessa. Lake Berryessa should have been a rocket launch for him. I mean, it's an east layup to become the terror of the Bay Area, but instead he fumbles the ball in his own end zone and acts like it never happened, like he's embarrassed, really. He mentions Lake Berryessa only once. Odd, isn't it? And what I believe Michael is referring to is the Zodiac Killer wrote in a letter that I'm the murderer of the taxi driver, referring to Paul Stein, and I did in the two kids in the North Bay Area. And that's all that the Zodiac Killer said about Lake Berryessa. Now, why is this? Some people think that... The Zodiac Killer didn't actually commit the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and it was a copycat who learned about it from the newspapers. And other people think that, well, he had already proven that he had committed the crime in several different ways. He didn't need to write a letter about it. Number one, as previously stated, the Zodiac wrote a message on the car door at Lake Berryessa, including the Zodiac symbol. Number two, the Zodiac made a phone call one hour and ten minutes after the Lake Berryessa stabbing, saying that, I want to report a murder, no, a double murder that one. And thirdly, by the time that the Zodiac Killer wrote that letter, he almost certainly would have known that Brian Hartnell would have survived the Lake Berryessa stabbing the male victim, as well as Cecilia Shepard even surviving for two days in the hospital and able to give testimony, and they were able to tell the story of the Zodiac costume. So it really appears to me that the Zodiac Killer knew that, knew that people knew it was him. The Zodiac understood that people knew it was him, and maybe it wasn't necessary to take credit for it in a letter he had already proven to the authorities and the media that he had committed the crime. But it is an unsolved case. Now, here's another thing, though. He mentions Lake Berryessa indirectly only once. Odd, isn't it? The whole Mikado garbage is his way out of not knowing what the fuck he was doing out there. But the Mikado and the costume connection are pure theory, as he never links the two directly in words. But I thought it novel if he was trying some sleight of hand to make someone believe that they were connected, even though they really weren't. Zodiac's all about his image after 1969. Can't wait to see what the new BBOR format is. My, and this is uh, from, once again, Michael Fisher. Now, what I believe Michael is talking about is the Zodiac did not pretend to be the Lord High Executioner at Lake Berryessa. He didn't use dialogue from the Mikado. He was talking about being an escaped convict and trying to get to Mexico and saying, all I want is your money, and he made up some wild story. He possibly said that he killed a guard in Deer Lodge, Montana, but he's not saying, I am the Lord High Executioner, I'm going to punish you for flirting. And believe it or not, the Mikado is mostly about that. It's about people who get punished for flirting. So, I mean, there are possible Zodiac connections. But what I think Michael is trying to say is all of that is just speculation. There is no definitive link between the Lake Berryessa stabbing and the Mikado. And if there is, it all is from things that would have happened after the stabbing. He didn't leave a single Lake Berryessa um, connection directly to the Mikado. Or he did leave a single Mikado connection to, at Lake Berryessa that would definitively say that that's what he was doing. And perhaps, perhaps this is just some type of guy who had some type of weird plan and maybe he threw together the costume rather quickly. And everyone thinks that the Zodiac is some type of cold, methodical, and calculating individual, when in reality he could have been somewhat sporadic, somewhat impulsive, and was like, okay, here's some black fabric. I'm going to sew on the Zodiac symbol and I'm going to put on the clip-on sunglasses. It could have been done the night before. It could have been done the morning of the stabbing. We don't necessarily know what the Zodiac's intentions were with the Lake Berryessa costume, but I definitely want to thank Moonlight and Michael for sharing these um, things here about the um, Zodiac killer, and I also wanted to say that for Zodiac Monday, I'm hoping to do some explorations into some different aspects of the true crime world. There are two books that I've really wanted to read for a while, and they are Unsolved No More by Ken Maines and Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape by Cloyd Steiger. And they are both going to be exploring the detective process, the investigative process of true crime, as opposed to simply, okay, this is a serial killer, or this is an unsolved mystery, and these are some clues that will help us solve the mystery, or these are some details about the serial killer's life. I think that both of these books will be a very good addition to Zodiac Monday, and I'm also hoping that there will be a larger 
Anything Goes Friday episode on Ken Maines' book, Unsolved No More. Unsolved No More is also the name of his YouTube channel. Ken Maines is most famous for being on the History Channel's program, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, along with his partner, Sal. They did some very big deep dives into the Zodiac suspects, Lawrence Kane and Ross Sullivan. And I would like to give a shout-out to longtime BBOR supporter Batman66, who asked me a question about returning to America, and how long am I going to be here in the Philippines? And the answer is, I don't know, as long as I can. But he was asking him about when I'm going back to West Virginia. As many of you know, BBOR started in West Virginia, always from West Virginia at heart, even though I'm on the other side of the globe. And my ultimate answer is, Batman 66 got me curious about a plan that I had in the past, and that was to go to some different places in West Virginia and t take the show on the road, literally. I'm talking about full mobile recording, maybe just sit out in the by the window like I did back in 2018, pick up the sounds of the crickets in the uh, in the night sky and so on. And I used to do this for real, like I, w I had to just would sit by the open window and I would record BBO War back in 2018, and I think that it worked even though it might have been a questionable recording choice. And sometimes I did the show completely outdoors on a nice summer evening. I would be sitting at a picnic table, believe it or not. And, um, I mean, I kind of miss that vibe, you know, getting back to the whole West Virginia country roots and so on. But my family is actually from Sistersville, West Virginia. I didn't grow up in that part of uh, the state. Sistersville is on the western side of West Virginia. I grew up on the eastern side. But my family was from there in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And when we go to the family reunions, we would always have uh, stories about people growing up in Sistersville. And we actually had one reunion out in Sistersville. And it's famous for a place called the Wells Inn. The Wells Inn is a hotel that has its claim to fame as perhaps maybe the only hotel in the world to have a haunted toilet. I kid thee not, a haunted toilet. It's actually a haunted urinal. But I thought about doing an episode on about it for Black Box Online Radio, but then I decided, you know, perhaps we don't need to hear about the spooky haunted urinal and all of the nasty things that it's going to do to you. But I really thought about, you know, driving out to Sistersville, West Virginia, and then heading down south to a place called Waiteville, and that's like almost a bucket list thing to do. This is like kind of a solo road trip that I've been planning for like nine years that I haven't gotten around to doing. I mean, I ended up in the Philippines, kind of missed the mark. But Waiteville is part, really the only um, town that is within West Virginia's section of the Jefferson National Forest. It's an unincorporated town, but we have a lot of those in West Virginia. And I would love to just go back out there and um, do a little bit of a recording surrounded by all of the West Virginia trees going through some of them rolling hills again. Uh, maybe someday, maybe sooner than later. See, that's the problem. As soon as I start doing something, I get the idea to do something else. Do you ever get like that where your ideas are changing all the time? But I give credit to uh, Batman66 for getting me thinking on that path. And I said that I would switch over to start discussing the case of the Bayou Strangler. The Bayou Strangler was a serial killer who operated in the new millennium, named Ronald Dominey from Louisiana. And I first heard about him only recently because of a documentary that was made available on Tubi called Bayou Blue. Yes, indeed, we have Tubi here in the Philippines. And it was a very saddening documentary talking about this very vicious serial killer in Louisiana. And Ronald Dominey murdered at least 23 people. It's possible that he murdered other people. But his victims were exclusively male, he was a homosexual, he lived a very troubled life, and he decided to turn his rejection from society into very destructive behavior. He went on to become a serial killer, and the problem is, though, when I was listening to the story of Ronald Dominique, and I also watched the A&E show about him and read some articles, and he's just a clear example of somebody who didn't need to do any of this. He was someone who had a chance to have a future, and he threw it all away to become a serial killer. He grew up in poverty in Louisiana, and he was able to graduate high school, though. He was able to get into college. He was studying computer science, but he dropped out. Even if he had dropped out, he was still a high school graduate. He could have had an ordinary, honest, working job and just been a normal guy, but that wasn't acceptable to him. 
And a big reason for this is people believe that Ronald Dominique was ashamed of his homosexuality, and also he was living as a homosexual at a time when it wasn't very acceptable to do that in Louisiana, even the, in the early parts of the new millennium. So when people found out that he was a homosexual, his peers immediately began to ridicule him, and he denied it very, very strongly. But ultimately, he came out of the closet, and then he thought that he was going to be embraced by the gay community, but they also denied him because, for starters, he was an antisocial person. He had spent his whole life mostly being an outcast, so he had very bizarre social skills, and even to the point where he took up becoming somewhat of a drag queen and also a performer, he would impersonate Patti LaBelle, and it seems like he was somewhat of a bad I imposter because people just didn't take a liking to it, and this was really talked about in the A&E show when they said that he was somewhat of a lackluster performer, and he thought that he was just going to be welcomed by the gay community, and he finally found a group that would understand him, but they, he didn't bond well with that community either. Now, this is something that serial killers do that is unacceptable, that goes to show that they are completely in the wrong, that is just ridiculous, and that is that when they are alienated, they resort to murder. And Lots of people feel alienated. Lots of people feel closed off. Lots of people feel like they don't belong in social groups. And they don't go on to become murderous individuals. Look at the story of the North Pond Hermit. Some guy who just decided to go live in the woods for 20 years or whatever it was. And I also used to talk about the channel Barehanded Enterprises here on Black Box Online Radio. And I would share you know, the things from the host about how he would like to spend the majority of his time alone, but what he started to do was build his own airplane. He was building his own bush plane, and he had this shed and that he turned into an airplane hangar, and he was building it out of scraps, and he had a pet dog that would accompany him on the building sessions. Lots of people choose to deal with a lone wolf style lifestyle. Lone wolf style lifestyle, yet yeah, that didn't roll off the tongue too well, but that's the whole point. They are finding blessings and solitude. Now, you might be thinking, the North Pond Hermit or this guy from Barehanded Enterprises, they voluntarily chose to live this way, whereas somebody like Ronald Dominique, the Bayou Strangler, did not voluntarily choose to live that way, and I even have to admit that's somewhat true. He wanted acceptance and approval, and he also felt ashamed of who he was. So, the way that Ronald Dominique was trying to attract people to him was he would lure men exclusively younger boys a lot of them were either homeless or people who left live somewhat of a criminal or deviant life and he would lure them back to a particular trailer or a particular kill site and he would tell them that he was either going to have sex with them or with one point that was heavily, heavily shared in Bayou Blue. One thing that was heavily discussed in the documentary Bayou Blue is sometimes his victims were heterosexual and they did not go seeking gay sex at all. They were actually lured there thinking that they were going to meet a woman. He's saying, yeah, yeah, I know this woman. She's going to be down for it. He would tell them that he, they're going to meet up with this woman and have some type of encounter, and then he would ultimately murder them. And on the A&E show, they talked about how he became the Bayou Strangler because it goes to show an act of dominance. He wanted to feel, feel the act of strangulation. He wanted to feel the victim's suffering as he would choke them with his own with his own power absolutely sick absolutely disgusting but that is how some of these serial killers operate they just want to have power they feel rejected from society so they want to destroy people in a very stealthy way they don't want to simply go out all at once those are the mass shooters that want to just commit an enormous amount of destruction before they either die or apprehend it, or in some cases try to escape. Instead, with serial killers, they want to deceive people. They just want to live in this mask of deception where they want to live a normal life, and then they want to murder people in the shadows. I think Ronald Dominique, the Bayou Strangler, is an excellent example of that. I say excellent only meaning he is a very clear example of that. Everything he did was terrible. But Bayou Blue, the documentary from Tubi, also wanted to re-emphasize a particular point, and that is that the media did not really want to take notice of the story at first, and they even 
postulated that perhaps it was because it was too horrific of a story. Perhaps it was something that just the general public couldn't wrap their heads around. At least 23 young men murdered, and not only that, but also raped, strangled, and it was something that perhaps was a little bit too gruesome for the mainstream media to discuss because another story that became more popular was the story of a woman who had murdered her two children and tried to commit suicide herself unsuccessfully, and the Louisiana media took that story and ran with it, and it became way more popular at the time than that of the Bayou Strangler. And they didn't say this directly in Bayou Blue, but they insinuated it, that it was maybe a story that people could comprehend and wrap their heads around, and it was just less gruesome and less horrific. But I think that there are many, many examples of serial killers who are very gruesome and horrific that get widely discussed. John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, these are some of the most uh, vicious and bizarre and twisted serial killers out there. I mean, John Wayne Gacy was the killer clown, a bisexual serial killer. I mean, he was bisexual in his sexual orientation, but he targeted males. Jeffrey Dahmer was a homosexual as well, targeted males. And Jeffrey Dahmer did all sorts of cringe-worthy things. When I would watch documentaries about Jeffrey Dahmer, I would literally just cringe and feel sick when they start talking about the mummified hands and the cooking pots. Absolutely disgusting. So, I think that the general public can comprehend that as a whole, but also they do zone in on particular serial killer stories. For example, Dean Coral the Candyman was another very, very vicious homosexual serial killer, and he is not widely discussed at the same levels of popularity as Jeffrey Dahmer or John Wayne Gacy. With Gacy, people can comprehend that he was the killer clown, and that he was um, some guy who played these games with people, putting the handcuffs on them, and would say the trick to get out of it is to have the key... People can understand that, whereas somebody with Ronald Dominique, like Ronald Dominique, the Bayou Strangler, he was a pervert, he was a reject, he was someone who wasn't able to form relationships, and he resorted to becoming a serial killer, he resorted to murder as a way to respond to that, and that is just so immoral, it just becomes saddening, and you even get a little bit sick just thinking about it. But at this point, I would like to turn it over to you guys, and I would like to know, what do you think about all of these uh, stories that have been shared? What do you think about anything in regards to the Zodiac Killer mystery or the Bayou Strangler? And what do you think about the media's perception of serial killers? And are there some serial killer stories that are just too gruesome and horrific to share? Or are there other serial killer stories that just become more widely discussed for other reasons. I mean, maybe there's something that stands out, as I said, about maybe John Wayne Gacy and his clown makeup, and there's something that people can um, just remember a little bit more easily. What What do you really think about all of that? Serial killers, media perceptions, the Zodiac Killer, and anything that you'd like to share. If you have some comments about any books you'd like to recommend about forensic investigations. I would love to read your ideas in the comments section down below. Anybody can write the show at Blackbox on my radio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And feel free to uh, check out some of the links in the description box as well. I wrote a book called Killer on a White Horse, which will be released in audio version soon. Buymeacoffee.com slash BlackboxNed88. And BlackboxNed88 is also, of course, the name of my Instagram page. And I will see you over there. Until next time.